um, next week you get to study hard for your exams. And we'll begin with Brian Riddle talking about, well, we all know hash tables, but how do you distribute them? That's what we'll find out. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Riddle. I got my bachelor's here in 2013. I've been working at uh, Extreme Software since. Um, in this semester, I decided I wanted to uh, try and get involved in research a little bit, so I uh, decided to learn about distributed hash tables. Um, and Dr. Yurongic has been very supportive and helping me a lot uh, during this adventure. So, yeah, let's talk about distributed hash tables. Um, distributed hash tables, uh, a distributed hash table is a network of computers that provides a lookup service similar to uh, the hash tables that you typically think of. So given a key, you can find the uh, value associated with that key efficiently. Um, when I say efficiently, I, I guess I should clarify when you think of hash tables, you usually think of the main advantage being that um, you get constant time lookups. And you shouldn't expect that with a distributed hash table. Um, with distributed hash tables, your um, highest latency operation is a network request. So when we talk about time complexity, we'll think of how uh, many network requests you have to make in order to do something. Um, let me give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll talk about some of the uh, uses of distributed hash tables and give some motivation and um, some distributed hash tables in the wild. I'll talk about Ford, which is a uh, distributed hash table protocol uh, that I've focused my attention on. And uh, we'll go into detail about that talking about how lookups work and uh, how the network manages to regulate itself with nodes uh, becoming unavailable and new nodes joining the network. And uh, I'll wrap up with a demo of an uh, implementation of a distributed hash table that I've done to serve Wikipedia articles. And uh, then after that, I'll provide some resources for uh, learning more. So, Uses for distributed hash tables. Why? Why does anybody care? Why do I care? Um, I got interested in distributed hash tables because I'm uh, interested in centralized systems as an alternative to uh, centralized systems for reasons uh, such as privacy. Um, you can also uh, do more practical, less paranoid things with um, distributed hash tables. Uh, for example, you all have probably seen lately uh, Wikipedia, every time you hit it, um, it's requesting money um, because it's very expensive to run a service like Wikipedia. Um, although it provides a tremendous social value, it uh, is very expensive. And uh, I see distributed hash tables as one mechanism for building uh, distributed applications that allow the architects of those applications to distribute the costs of those applications among users or among volunteers instead of raising millions of dollars in capital in order to survive. Uh, to be a little more concrete, uh, here's some examples of distributed hash tables in the uh, wild. Uh, there's Apache Cassandra, which is a distributed database and it depends on distributed hash tables. There's IPFS, which stands for Interplanet Carry File System. Um, it's an attempt at uh, distributing the web so that you can find static content, such as images or web pages, uh, by their name um, rather than by the server that they reside on, so it provides some locality in that way. And there's a BitTorrent, which is a file sharing platform, and the way BitTorrent uses distributed hash tables is it actually uh, uses a distributed hash table <laughs> at a 
lookup service for peers to download files. So if you have a torrent file uh, for downloading, um, say like an archive of Wikipedia, um, you can use that torrent as your key and you'll do a lookup and the values you get back are uh, a list of peers that you can connect to to actually download um, the data. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about how that works uh, specifically by introducing Cord. Uh, so Cord is the uh, distributed hash table protocol that I've been focusing on. It was introduced uh, by the authors on the screen uh, in 2001. The research was done at MIT. Um, in the paper where they describe Cord, uh, they often refer to uh, Napster. I guess we were just in the, the wake of uh, Napster's demise at the time, and they uh, were trying to motivate some discussion by talking about a uh, scalable lookup service that is able to handle uh, you know, those joining, those leaving, complexities like that. Uh, Cord is interesting because if you understand the ideas behind Cord, you can uh, pretty easily understand the ideas behind other distributed hash table protocols, uh, some of which include Kademlia, that's the protocol that BitTorrent uses. It came around a few years later. There's also Pastry and Tapestry, which were also introduced around 2001. Um, so <coughs> let's talk about how Ford works. Um, we'll talk about how lookups work starting with some terminology. Um, so every node and every key in your network uh, has an identifier, uh, 160-bit identifier that you can get, um, say, using uh, SHA-1. Um, I know that there is some effort, you know, it's, it's been determined that SHA-1 is not collision resistant, so it's being you know, phased out uh, in favor of more collision resistant alternatives. Uh, there's no really reason you would have to use SHA-1, you could use um, almost anything else, but let's, uh, let's go with every key and every node in your network is identified by a 160-bit hash obtained using uh, SHA-1. So you, you say it's not, a, uh, it's not that important that it's SHA-1. Is it important that it be a cryptographic hash function as opposed to just a checksum or something like that? You know, I'm not actually sure how to answer your question. Um, I would say it's important to make sure that the uh, output values are um, well distributed um, and that Part of that would be not having too many collisions. Um, I think that that's the uh, most important part. Um, I, I suppose if you were worried about um, making an implementation that was um, very resistant to uh, attacks on the network, then it might be kind of important. Um, but um, I'm not completely sure about that. Yes. So uh, on the slide here, I've got examples of keys and nodes um, in the diagram there. There's uh, the blue circles represent uh, nodes and the black circles represent keys. Um, so talking about trying to serve Wikipedia with a distributed hash table, you might uh, have article titles as the keys and the actual article as your uh, data. So you might have an article on titled Alan Turing, and you might have an article titled University of Kentucky. And you have a node in your network um, that you hash its IP address, and you get an identifier. Um, in this case, five, you hash the title University of Kentucky, um, and you get an identifier, in this case, um, two. Uh, you'll notice that this is a range in a um, circle We'll call this the identifier circle, um, and it's an important property of Cord. Um, the reason that it's important is that the, uh, well, 
you've got two to the 160 um, hash functions, right? And you just want to think of this as modular arithmetic. So uh, at two to the 160, you roll back over to value zero. And the uh, notion of successors and predecessors is important. So uh, the node that succeeds you comes clockwise uh, in the circle, and uh, your predecessor can be found going counterclockwise. Uh, let's talk about the notion of uh, successors a little bit more. There's uh, an important function, the successor function that takes an identifier and yields another identifier that identifies the node that uh, follows you in the identifier circle, right? So I have a couple of examples here. Um, you start at the top of the circle with identifier zero, your uh, node is node one. Uh, identifiers two and four are uh, succeeded by uh, node five. Um, and the reason that successors are important is that a node uh, responds to queries for the keys whose identifiers it succeeds, if that makes sense. So uh, more concretely, uh, five stores the keys that have identifiers two and four. And here blue, blue means it's a node, black means it's a key. Yes. It's a, it's a key, um, you know, with, uh, in our example, uh, titles of Wikipedia articles that are hashed to produce an identifier. Um, those identifiers are uh, denoted in black. Why do you say successor 12 is 15? I would have expected 14. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I just messed up. And while we're at that successor 10, is it really 10 or is it 11? That really is right. Um, yes. So, um, if you know, like a computer and a key uh, hash to the same identifier, then uh, that key would be served by the node uh, with the same identifier. Uh, so let's talk about how this works in practice. Uh, going back to uh, my example, uh, say. So to do a lookup, you have to make a connection to the network. So you connect to some node in the network. Uh, let's say you connect to node five, and you want to find the article on the University of Kentucky. Uh, well, that's really easy. Um, node five responds to that request, right? Because it's the successor of uh, the University of Kentucky's identifier. Um, how do you serve the article on Alan Turner? if you're node five. Um, well, you, you don't uh, succeed the Alan Turing article, so you don't serve it. Uh, one uh, will serve it. But how do you know that as a node of the network, right? Um, it's possible that uh, node five could uh, store information about the entire network. And it could say, well, I know that one is the successor of uh, identifier 15, so I'll just pass it on to him. Uh, but that doesn't scale very well, right? Uh, if you have a network of a million nodes, um, it becomes impractical to uh, keep live connections to you know, a million different computers. Um, alternatively, you could just know about one node in the network, say the uh, node that comes after you in the identifier circle, and you could forward requests on, so five to 10, 10 to 11, and so on, uh, which will eventually end up being served by node one, but now you've gone through every node in your network to uh, serve a request, which again, in a, node of a, mil or a network of a million nodes, um, is very high latency and not very practical. So it turns out that by um, being choosy about the nodes that we store information about, we can um, serve these requests in login requests, where n is the size of your network, or n is the number of nodes in your network. That is accomplished uh, by something called a finger table.
So uh, every node stores a finger table, and it stores the successors or identifiers that comes after it and powers it to. Right? So 5 uh, stores the successors of ID 6, 7, 9, and 13, because those are all powers of 5. So it knows that 6, 7, and 9 are succeeded by 10, and it knows that um, 13 is succeeded by 14. Um, going back to the um, other slide, if you want to uh, serve, if you want to connect to node 5 and uh, get served the article on Alan Turing, um, node 5 looks in its finger table where it hashes Alan Turing gets the identifier, um, notices that the identifier is greater than any of the identifiers that it has fingers for in its finger table. So it just passes the query along to the, uh, the last node that it knows about, which is 14. So we've gone halfway across the circle and we've eliminated um, half the nodes from this request. And then 14 does the same thing, right? It um, says, well, I don't serve, or I don't store the data on the Alan Turing article either. So it um, forwards it to its first finger, which is one. And um, you know, we were able to serve that uh, request in you know, two hops. So you know, there's five nodes in this network. Two hops is pretty good login. Um, so would you, since there are 160 bits, would you expect 160 entries then? Yes. Yes. Um, and yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. So like I said, um, Ford is designed to work well when you don't know um, when nodes are going to be leaving or when nodes are going to be joining. Um, so let's talk about how nodes join a little bit. Um, if you're a node who wants to join a uh, network, you just need to know about one other node in the network to bootstrap. And um, what you need to get from the node in the network is the node that comes after you in the identifier circle, right? Um, so once you know the node that comes after you, uh, if you were a node, um, you could successfully route um, queries efficiently. Because even though, say, your finger table may not be uh, correct, you can just forward on requests to your successor, and uh, then he is able to uh, forward the requests and answer them and log in steps. Um, but there are, uh, you know, getting your finger tables correct is important because it means that you're able to uh, more efficiently traverse the network. Um, and there are a couple of algorithms for making sure your finger tables are correct. Um, in my particular implementation, um, you just sort of run in the background. Um, the funny thing about this kind of is, is that if you've got uh, 160 entries, um, if you go to each entry and you, you know, use a login time query to find the successor for each uh, finger in your finger table that you have in 160 times um, in query or you know, log in queries you have to make. Um, and that uh, is fine. It can be improved uh, to log in or uh, a little easier to implement is log in squared. Um, but for like sufficiently big networks, you actually don't want to use the uh, log in squared algorithm if you've got like a million nodes, um, you've got 200, or I'm sorry, 20 times 20 uh, queries you have to make, which is 400, which is actually more than just uh, doing every uh, query itself. Um, when you join, you also have to accept data from someone, because you now are responsible for some of the data. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, 
distributed hash tables employ consistent hashing, uh, the result being that when a node joins and you have to take on uh, new um, data, well, when the node that joins has to take on new data, it only has to take on you know, about the number of keys in your network divided by the number of nodes in your network. So often for like a non-distributed hash table, you would uh, like completely rehash everything if you change like the number of buckets you have or something. But for this, like if node three, if a node with identifier three joined, it would only need to take on some of the data that node five serves, right? And that's gonna be, if, you're, if all your keys are evenly distributed, um, that's gonna be a subset of uh, the data. But it only works so well um, as long as you've got some level of parity between the, uh, the nodes and the keys. So, uh, like I keep mentioning, um, I uh, wanted to serve Wikipedia, right? So the English version of Wikipedia has like 14 million articles. Um, so I went to Amazon and got like 10 servers, right? Um, but it turns out, like after a while, servers are kind of expensive, so you stop buying them. So you get 10 servers and um, you try to distribute you know, 14 million articles and suddenly like, every node is responsible for approximately one and a half million keys. Um, and if you have any sort of redundancy uh, to deal with uh, faults, um, you know, it, it's even more than that. So if a new node joins the network, suddenly you have to transfer a million articles, which uh, is kind of expensive. Um, so while I'm on the subject, um, let me show you guys uh, my work a distributed hash table and um, serving uh, Wikipedia with it. Let's get rid of all that. It's going to be difficult. Okay. I didn't think this through. I'm going to have to type and look over my shoulder. Um, that's okay. So I, I have some nodes running and I built a little client kind of like Telnet. So let's say that you uh, want to use this, right? You want to get the uh, article that I promised on the University of Kentucky. Okay, there it is. This is the uh, text for uh, the University of Kentucky article on Wikipedia in um, Wikipedia's markdown. So it's kind of difficult to read. Um, but that's it. Um, something that I am kind of happy with that I hadn't encountered elsewhere is I made some utilities to uh, map the network. So for small networks, this works well. So I just ran map, um, and it crawled through the network. And uh, it's going to let me show it to you guys. Uh, this is in. Um Cyclic order based on the hash values? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me. Let's zoom out. Uh, yeah, so this is what our uh, network looks like. It's actually only got nine nodes because one of mine went down. Um, and it's a little unbalanced, um, but that's what are you going to do? Um, but this is this is what the uh, the network looks like, right? At the top of the network, you've got the uh, node that I made my initial connection to, and um, yeah, this is the identifier circle showing the spacing uh, as it's distributed. Um, you can kind of see, or you can see, um, how nodes get or how requests get routed. Like I promised. Promise that they're efficient. So let's say that you want to uh, read more about Cord, right? This is the title for the Cord article. So map request Cord peer to peer. It's going to crawl the network and then it's going to quickly 
show you uh, the iterative queries it has to make. There, so the node at the top is the node I connected to, and you can tell by these lines um, how uh, the routes, or how the request got routed, and ultimately which node ended up serving the request. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's what I've been working on. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in Experimenting more with um, distributed hash tables. You know, let me quickly forward through these. Um, you can check out my implementation on GitHub. Um, you can play around with it. Uh, I think that the network visualizer tool um, is kind of nice. I haven't come across it yet. Um, but you should also uh, check out some other um, resources. Uh, the Official MIT uh, implementation is available on GitHub, although I think it's uh, more difficult to get set up and running. Um, and you should also check out the, uh, the paper on Quark. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting, and they do a lot of cool uh, network diagnostic stuff. But uh, thanks for listening, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, what did you use to collect all the pages? Wikipedia is super helpful and they provide an archive uh, every couple of months um, that you can download from Wikipedia itself. And um, you can either just download it from the site or um, you can torrent it. Uh, it's about like 12 gigabytes compressed, and then if you uncompress it, it's about 50 gigabytes. And then I just use my implementation to distribute it across the so implementation. You're sorting through 50 gigabytes of data. Which one are you doing with page number one? Not sorting through it, but you're searching. You're using your hash to your hash to find the information. Um in theory, yes. In practice here, no. So I uh, I, I try to uh, distribute 50 gigabytes of data like I mentioned earlier but um, it became too expensive too quickly to, uh, to direct the data to all the right servers. So what I ended up doing um, is I uh, put a subset of Wikipedia up. So I put like uh, 100,000 articles or something like that. I was going to say, pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, It would still be quick, like the the problems that I ran into weren't with um, lookups. You know, you would still be able to efficiently find the node, um, and then I uh, basically just built a hash table that tells you uh, where the data for any key lives on your file system, and you can just go open that file and serve it. So that would actually probably be pretty simple. Um, the the problem I ran into. Uh, with distributing it, which could have been avoided with more foresight, was that I was parsing it all on one machine, and then I was using that one machine to send the data into like one node and having that node direct the data to the the right place, right? So I was doing like you know a lot of data every second, uh, and so, like my servers just weren't happy. So I, I wasn't, so I didn't end up doing the whole thing. But you know you could. Quickly do lookups of a large data set. Pretty efficient. When a machine crashes, you lose a lot of stuff. You have to rebuild it. Yeah, yeah. Um, when a machine crashes, um, the paper that I keep referencing is kind of agnostic about this. But it um, suggests that you might just, um, every time you do a write, replicate the data to some number of nodes adjacent to you. So in my implementation, like every article is replicated against two nodes. And so if you fail, uh, probably somebody, with some probability, you won't lose all the data. Okay. Well, thank you very much.